Okay, so um, let me see. Um, I'm getting echo from my husband upstairs. Hold on. Um, I also wanted to say, can you hear me? Because I can't hear myself. Okay. Um, I want to say if anybody's got any questions during the talk, if you put them in the chat, then I can address them at the end. So um, I'm Siobhan, I live in Amsterdam, but I do have links with Dean Clough because I organized an exhibition there a few years ago called Landshapes. And it was a combination of um, semi-abstract paintings from the Netherlands and Britain. Um, it was really interesting to do, and I think it'd be really, really difficult to do now, post-Brexit. Um, the other link I have with Yorkshire is that my mum lives in Home Firth nearby, near Home Firth in Hepworth. So, and I'm very fond of Yorkshire, and I'm very, very much missing Yorkshire at the moment. So it's great to be able to uh, present to, yeah, to everybody from all over England and beyond. So my talks uh, about the work I've been doing during COVID, but not all of the work, because I've done a lot. This is focusing on one particular thing, which is a book I made called uh, Vintage Advice for Corona People. So I'm going to talk about some pages from that book um, and also why I think it's important uh, to work in this particular format. So the aesthetics of care in the time of COVID. And I just want to reduce that. Okay, right. So I'm mainly known for books that I've written about quiet places, quiet New York, Amsterdam, London. I've written eight books. And one of the reasons I did this is because I'm deaf in my left ear. So I really seek out quiet places. And that's one of the reasons I like living on the edge of Amsterdam at the moment near the countryside. So I I'm, used to teach photography in the University in London, Sir John Cass. And now I've been working mainly on photo books. Quiet London sold a lot of copies and I really wanted it to kind of change people's attitudes. And this artist, a writer about artists, Suzanne Lacey, she says, an artwork is not as effective as a treaty or a law or a budget change. I don't think a single artwork transforms society, but what an artwork does is create a cultural milieu within which things will be understood differently. And that's exactly kind of how I see my work, sort of slowly, kind of gradually changing people's attitudes so that um, quietness, for instance, is appreciated more, possibly. But when Francis Lincoln, who published my book, um, made a postcard version, it didn't sell as well as the main book, even though I think postcards are really important kind of uh, medium, if you can say that about postcards. Um, I send a lot of postcards and I find a lot of pictures and I draw things and send them to friends. So for me, post is really important. But I think people wear postcard messages now or they text or they put things on Instagram or WhatsApp. So I wanted to look at the status of postcards. Now, one thing I need to do is check my notes. Whoops, I need to get some notes. Sorry about this. <laughs> Can't find. Okay. So, can you still hear me? I hope so. Um, Yorkshire is renowned for um, a company called Bamforth who produced postcards for many decades. And the Bamford postcards, as you can see, use humour to look at all sorts of kind of anxieties and insecurities we have. So they're often to do with fears about ageing, impotence and the loss of virility. And it sold more than 20 million postcards. So very different to the sales of postcard now. I wondered whether it was mainly women who sent cards. Now they are still sold in museums such as the British Museum. And this in particular, I was interested in because I actually bought this for my sister, Abby, when she had mumps. So I try and find postcards which are really relevant for that person. 
I like to try and get the perfect card for friends. And I really like it when friends send me postcards. This is by Keller Douglas of herself and her son, Stanley. So that still happens, perhaps less so now, actually. Um, I'm interested in postcards as having a kind of uh, a motive which is not always um, about maintaining the status quo. So this one is a, I see as a postcard as a disruptor of gender identity. Um, and Amanda L. Coles says arts can be a site for truth telling. She says the arts are a crucial mechanism whereby identities are formed and performed, an important vehicle where gender stereotyping can be reinforced, disrupted, and art projects explore different ways of being a man or a woman. So I wondered what are the aesthetics of postcards, the aesthetics of care, because a postcard is something we usually buy to send to somebody else. So I don't think we'd normally send a postcard that was critical or um, negative about the person. It's usually uh, associated with care. I think the aesthetics are they've got to be simple, simple messages, funny, kind, not attacking or mocking others, clever, witty, warm, affectionate, surprising, beautiful. And today I added the last sentence, often they challenge inequality, the abuse of power, racism, ableism and sexism. And I think one thing I really like about postcards is the importance of access and affordability. So they're cheap. My book, if you buy the book, they work at about 30 pence each, really affordable. They can be easily stored. I've got boxes and boxes of postcards that have been sent to me that I've bought from museums. And they're easily sent. And I think that they can acquire what Walter Lee describes as an No, 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 I've got a so they have this aura. They can they can become special beyond the kind of bit of paper that you know something's been printed on in mass production, and they're a good way to disseminate ideas and images we wouldn't go and see. So, for instance, John Murphan Jago, uh, a Namibian artist, I wouldn't have known about this um, artist unless my friend Maggie had sent me this card. So I think they're democratic. So thinking about care, we've talked about aesthetics of postcards, care. Artists are starting to recognise, I think, that we need to care for ourselves. So this postcard, I don't know whether you can see, it has on it self-care at Christmas. And I think this is so nurturing. It's OK to pause. You're allowed to say no. Your best is totally enough. There's no such thing as perfect. I just think I felt so kind of um, looked after by this card that a friend sent. And I think postcards are often associated tenderness. I think this one I found in a, in a uh, non-denominational quiet room, which is a bit like a chapel in a hospital. So it's in Dutch. Um, and I like the combination of poem and image. I think I might do something like this myself. But I think postcards are always political, even if they don't look as if they are. This is 1983 woodcut by... Matthias Mayundi Mozambique from Mozambique. I've had this probably about 30 years. Um, and these images have an impact on me. I think uh, they're a way of nurturing my art practice in a way. Um, so how did I care for myself during lockdown? Well, I did life drawing. This was one in London. I went to a, a mask making workshop at the Tropen Museum, which is the Museum of the Tropics in Amsterdam. And uh, quite kind of famous designers gave us different masks to kind of make. And then um, I sent out a Christmas card, which is an old photograph, because I like finding existing things, recycling things. And uh, the text for this card was that accompanied this image was, hey girls, the DNA for the COVID vaccine is hidden inside this glass swan. And then it just made me realize that adding humor during the time of COVID was really important. And for people who weren't Christians, I sent this card. Miriam soon realized that nurses' capes were not ideal PPE to wear in the COVID-19 ward. So that's a New Year's card. And sadly, I couldn't use images from this era in my book because you need 70 years after the death of the author or the photographer before the image is out of copyright. So that's why it was just sent as a, a New Year's card. So 
I found some old photos and I thought, well, yeah, I'm enjoying this. And the fact that it was giving me pleasure to add text to existing postcards, I thought, this is what I need during the time of COVID when I can't really see my friends. And then I found that a lot of people in around 1918 were standing really far apart. And I wondered whether this was historically kind of relevant because it might have been because of the 1918 flu pandemic. It was just a mystery, and I'll never solve that mystery, but I do have some theories about it. So I put together these cards and made a book um, called Vintage Advice for Corona People. Um, and it made me really happy, really happy to do it and to find the postcards, to buy them online. They're mainly German, I think, actually. And I acknowledged all sorts of things which probably aren't there when you just pick up the book, but they are there in my thinking about collecting the images and text. So this was, um, the text for this was, don't go to beauty spots, especially with your badly dressed sister. So I acknowledge family and sibling rivalry. And I was also thinking about who had access to the camera and who was photographed, um, who was excluded from the shots, who represents themselves. Um, and it's often wealthy people who had photographs taken. But I didn't ignore class differences in making the book. So I was making a joke about this. Going canoeing on your very own lake is a great way to socially isolate. I mean, how many of us have our own lakes? But I couldn't include culturally diverse images. This is from the 60s that I found on the internet because of copyright reasons. And um, all the ones before 1920, had colonial scenes with unnamed workers in the distance. So they were not, you know, I don't feel I could sort of make a humorous comment about those. They're, they're, I didn't want to reinforce those prejudices and assumptions. And there weren't any images of disabled people. This one, again, I got from the internet. Um, the only online photos of veterans I um, uh, found were people uh, playing croquet and things like this. It's quite a nice image. It challenged my assumptions about um, sport at that time. But also, I can't use these because I didn't own them. But I did try to include uh, cultural differences and questioned heterosexual normativity. Um, and this is a statement from uh, and a report from Melbourne University. The arts are a crucial mechanism whereby identities are formed and performed and hence are an important vehicle whereby gender stereotyping can both be reinforced and disrupted with arts projects exploring different ways of being a man or woman or indeed disrupting the notion that one must be either. And so this image, which I really liked, don't promise to buy an ice cream when you know the cafes are shut. Um, I just like the fact that the little girl is being very honest. She's unhappy. We don't know why she was unhappy. I just invented a statement to go with this photo. It's nobody I know. It's a total stranger. And I like the fact that um, I could draw attention to the fact that bringing up children isn't always, uh, you know, easy. It's not idyllic images of motherhood. So I wanted to explore that in the book, but in a gentle way. And so... I think a lot of artists now are involved in thinking about social change, and that's been happening for a long time. Amanda L. Cole said, uh, the arts can be a site for truth-telling, revealing, promoting gender equality through the arts and creative industries. As, um, they are one way we tell lots of stories about our past, our present, and our futures. And it's as such, it's crucial that the stories being told are inclusive, the diversity of gendered experiences. Um, but I was also aware of the fact that a lot of people during COVID didn't have much money. And um, so I put in kind of activities where you didn't have to have any money at all. In fact, like this one, tell your children funny stories. And again, an opportunity to project and imagine what stories are being told in this uh, scenario. And I challenged ageism a bit, trying to look at invisibility of older women, uh, made them very human, uh, going paddling with both grandmas isn't a good idea. And maybe these women were not grandmas, they maybe a lesbian couple, we don't know. Um, Suzanne Lacey is an artist I really, really admire. Uh, she organised an inclusive event at Tade Modern, which included postcards, I think. 
she asks, what is different for you now with age? What can older women contribute? What are the challenges we face? Um, and she looks at how they worked with ac activism. And I wondered whether it's only or mainly older women who send postcards now. I know they send birthday cards. I get them from and Christmas cards. It's mainly from people over 70 now. Uh, and I think they mainly post photos on the phone on Instagram. I'm just curious, perhaps at the end, to ask who received a postcard in 20 and 2021. Not from me, because I send a lot. <laughs> So I was looking at humour as care. And again, Bamford's postcards. Um, more than, yeah, more than 20 million were sold. This is Annie Lawson's 1980s uh, cartoon, Death by Mattress. Feminist postcards were very important, I think, in um, defining who I was as an artist. And of course, the most recent uh, artist who sells and makes a lot of cards and a lot of images is David Shrigley. And for me, this, I have a postcard of this drawing, which is now on a mug, and it has high status. It's framed in my kitchen, but I think his work is often about loneliness, being an outsider, being imperfect. I like the fact he celebrates oddity and human imperfection. So, is it possible to change the status of postcards? There's David Shrigley's. It's quite expensive, a lot more expensive than mine. Hannah Laycock, I have MS and she has uh, multiple sclerosis as well. And I think postcards by artists show us things we couldn't otherwise imagine. And um, she deliberately tries to imagine uh, how other people can't see chronic illnesses such as MS. So she tries to visualise that in her work. And so I'm really pleased that I can get access to her work through the postcard she makes. And I think uh, postcards are very good at uh, being able to disseminate positive slogans. Then Bob and Roberta Smith, who is a... a um, an artist who is also a lecturer at the university where I used to teach. His name, when he teaches, is Patrick Brill. And he says the idea is to get people to realise that they have an individual voice and they have to look after this voice in a time of crisis. And he does other work as well. And he has great statements. We are going to crush the virus with art and we have got to tap into the life force, not the virus force. And very different kind of tone to mine, um, which is interesting to see for me. But I agree with the fact that we have to look after a voice in time of crisis. That's why I self-published the book. I couldn't get a publisher. So um, this is uh, Bob and Roberta Smith. But there are some people who are using post, for instance, the Verso, which is a writing, mainly poetry group. They would meet about once every two months in Amsterdam. They started sending uh, images and texts by post. You could subscribe for a year. Um, one thing I did during uh, lockdown and still doing is online yoga. And this one was sent by my friend Stein. And for me, post is precious because um, it often is a surprise. And also this one, I like the fact it combined both the book on yoga and a postcard and um, I think um, this card will go in my box of precious postcards. Mail art still happens. This is uh, an organization called Welcome Brea and Cloud Knitter in Belgium. I can tell people how to send work to this at the end. I'm also aware of the work of Liz Atkin who does drawing a self-care to overcome compulsive skin picking. And she's kind of very well renowned for that kind of work actually, um, works with the Welcome Collection. And my drawing started to change. Instead of doing single portraits, I started to draw people looking after each other or, or relating in some way to another. And so my art practice did change. And one thing I did, I recently made uh, some sample bookmarks for a, a new library within a library that's opening in September called Afro Beeb. Um, and then I realized because the person I kind of made these for said they looked a bit scruffy, <laughs> they didn't look very neat. 
um, an Amazon parcel packaging is just the right weight and thickness for bookmarks. So I like recycling cardboard. Um, and then I realized I needed to be more careful. So not only do I have to think about other people when I'm making cards and how to care for others with my text and images, uh, I need to be more careful myself. And that meant staying open to learning new skills, learning how different ways to draw. So the book, it really was a fantastic way to look after myself, making vintage advice for Corona people. Um, and this talk has helped me kind of reflect on the importance of the book for me and hopefully kind of uh, reveal a bit more about it to the people I know and people I don't know. So just want to say thank you. And this is my Instagram, um, my Instagram, what do you call it? My Instagram address, uh, my Instagram details. And this is one of my favorite photos from the book. Thank you to the, all the NHS staff everywhere. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Wow, um, that was really great. Like so, so in depth and um, a nice broad uh, view of your practice as well. Um, so that's great. Um, anybody have any initial thoughts or questions at all? Would anybody like to, if if you want to, just unmute or potentially like do the hand raising thing, whatever works best for you. Um, go for it. Hi, this is um, this is Christy. I used to live in Amsterdam, and, and when I first moved there, I was delighted to see that um, the, the funny combination of quite a, an independent, or like what I thought was a fresh advertise a take on advertising was to find the the racks of uh, business postcards on the bathrooms of clubs and restaurants. I don't know if that's still a thing or has um, media moved on from uh, postcards as a takeaway um, art. And how does Siobhan feel about that commercialization, but kind of a lot of cheeky um, ways to approach that irreverence and stereotype breaking that she, she has, um, propounded in her presentation? I think it's an interesting question. I think some of the postcards do seem really, uh, um, what's the word, asinine, kind of not very engaging. And you can see those are the ones that are left and that people don't pick up. It's the ones that the people have taken that I'm curious about. Um, I think uh, the commercialization is kind of, I see it as, something that's there but it's not something I find attractive uh, that's why I go to galleries and see the artworks and then I can pick up really interesting images um, and I often make them into artist books I don't know whether you can see me now am I still screen sharing can you see me or if I hold this up can anybody see this yeah um, I can't see myself let me see if I can change my view Right. So I, what, ah, that's better. So what I do is I find, like, this is a postcard from a film that came out last year called Shoplifter. And I use the card and recycled paper to make new notebooks. So even if it's a very commercial card like this one, I will do something with it <laughs> and uh, make it something non-commercial. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I have a commentary, no question. Here in Latin America, it's usually used postcards to make art. Yeah. I have an artist, I call an artist, who have an artwork called Cartas al Padre, is postcard for father, something like that in English. And she make a collective of different cards, not for herself, she uh, talk with the people, and people understand something uh, about um, for a father, for a partner, for something to answer about a difficult situation and put it in an in a artwork, you see, in an installation, if I remember. If you uh, 
issues really here have continued using postcard in in the events in in, in virtual too. We yes. in my in one of my collective do a postcard to send people in an email to invite a an and two. And um recently in Curator Space I see a submit to send postcards about feminists. Uh, about uh, people to kill uh, women and put in a card. What happened in that moment? What do you feel if a person you know with or not? And, and something about that. And they, she will make a big exhibition about that. So um, other person have to call it about around the world postcard you send to some place they person put something inside and say to her and the other put something inside and go inside to the first place and do a very big collection too and be civic too. I, I remember that. So I think it's good for uh, the manual things continue being using. Uh, in my case, I usually give to my boyfriend cards, postcards, and manual. So I think uh, it's no to be less. I think uh, it's more valuable because your hands is there. It's, it's something you make with your hands and you need to be involved in that in the art too. Uh, that's, a, that's my thing about it. I don't think something is less or more is because industrial or not. I think manuals continue to be used because it's valuable for the persons, not for the buildings. So you make your own cards then? What? You make your hand make your own cards. You don't buy them. No, usually I made it. Lovely. I forgot to mention that there's this postcard project, you might be interested in this. Uh, unfortunately, I missed the deadline. <laughs> there are 200 artists, 200 postcards, and an exhibition in London starting soon. So I'll add that to the um, chat later. And um, so artists see postcards as important. I'm curious about whether people who are not artists also see them as important now. Yeah, and I thought your comments are really interesting, Adriana. I will love it to be there. Really, <laughs> really love it. Um, I have a question. Before I actually ask the question, uh, I don't know if you can see behind me, um, there's a sort of uh, cabinet there. Yeah. I was in the Bamford family, apparently. You yeah. were. Bamford. When we bought the house, uh, the previous owners, they weren't Bamfords, but they couldn't take it with them. But uh, they told us it came from that family. So there was a connection here. Fascinating. And I think the museum's closed. I was trying to find details of it in Home Firth and I just couldn't. I don't know whether it's a temporary thing due to COVID. I don't I think know. It might be closed. Yeah, I think so. When I was working on the Home Firth Arts Festival quite a few years ago now, I think it was, I don't think it was open then. Mm. I think the building has been redeveloped into something else, Shivel. Okay. It shows how long it is since I've been to Home Firth. Yeah. <laughs> It was you were talking at one point about um, younger generations not sending birthday cards or Christmas cards, but sending things online. Um, do you think if um, people are devising, uh, I don't know whether people often devise their own uh, digital cards, but if they did and if they were to send those, uh, would that significantly change the, the quality of what is being communicated? Well, I think if people make their own cards, they're, they're really special. Um, and they, I hope they're seen as such by the people who receive them. But I don't think younger people really send cards very much now. I think it's many older people. Um, uh, I mean, I've got, I've got, I've got some re recently, I sent a card, I can't find it now. Um, but I, I think, for me, they're just really important because um, I think they make you feel a bit happier. And, you know, there's often quite surreal or silly. This one I quite like. 
you know, I just think that's witty. And you wouldn't find this in any, any other context. In a sense, it has to be, um, it has to be, uh, on the, this has to be on a card. It's an ideal format. Oh, I've got a question from Christy. Letter means postcard, email, Twitter. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure what you're saying, Christy. Are you saying that uh, a postcard is closer to Twitter? Um, yeah, so considering the, the limited geography of, or space, uh, space of a postcard, do you think that, I mean, uh, the, the backside where you have to do the writing, your thoughts are distilled um, the way, uh, you know, is there a parallel? A postcard is to a letter as Twitter is to an email yeah. where you have to distill it. Yes. Yeah. And I don't think I've quite got the um, skill of doing that. It's only when I do artworks that I really think about what I'm going to say. So perhaps I should, again, follow my own advice in my presentation and be more careful. Yeah. But also, I've been writing lots of poetry during COVID times. So uh, I had learned to kind of do things that are... Um, concise and thought through um, and one of the reasons I write poetry and do these kind of books is because I've got MS and I get tired so I can do something like a, a short sentence for a, uh, an image that I found from 1918 but I couldn't write a whole, um, a whole book about the history of postcards so I'm finding the format that is suitable for me knowing my health uh you know my chronic health condition and how my life is a bit constrained because of that my time is very constrained yeah so i was so, so i guess hmm. i was very it's, it's, at um, the start of the lockdown but it, i just got too tired but i'm going to put together a book of um uh, tweets i wrote partly in response to a local it's called Ian McMillan, who's internationally renowned, I think. And his, um, I would tweet to him, and if he liked my tweets or responded, it was just really, I got a bit addicted <laughs> to kind of try and get a response from Ian McMillan. And um, uh, I've stopped tweeting because I just don't have the energy or the time. But I'm going to make a book with cyanotypes of the tweets I wrote, um, almost like postcards of... Uh, that time in COVID, which doesn't feel like now. I think it's a really interesting concept to take something that's from the digital and quite sort of instant and accessible and to turn it into something that's kind of hard copy, um, that kind of, you know, that physical reality of a postcard. That sounds like a really nice project. Thank you, yes. Uh, I kind of wanted to broaden it out and make it more tactile and less ephemeral. Yes, Adriana, I have seen, I've, I've booked um, and paid for a Domestica course, but I haven't had time to do it yet. They are great. And the images in Domestica are so positive and so beautiful and the design is so wonderful. Just, just looking at the advertising makes you feel hopeful. I take two courses in bookmaking and I have one to pop up bookmaking to in this moment great so i recommend it because you can fix your postcards on your cards like an art book and fold it in much value and that is this moment in her making you know because in this moment the art books are more expensive than a normal book so maybe it's a building can be more uh, special, I think it is best. Look, I like to show you something. I have my own wall of podcast here. Oh wow! So, so yeah, is if you can sell something, people can consider like this. I have some art books in making, so that's the way you can continue the uh, the postcard in recording for the people, for the young people there. I think the better way to solve it. Yeah, it's interesting to see if postcards uh, get more popular, got more popular during COVID times. I think my husband hasn't muted himself. I can hear his guitar. <laughs> <laughs> no one else can though. 
a weekend, but we enjoy it, Daryl. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I've got my I've got my mic on. Oh dear. <laughs> so thank you for your comments and questions. And if anybody wants to buy a copy of the book, it's ten pounds but unfortunately because of brexit the cost of postage is 10 pounds so it's a bit expensive so um i can send you individual postcards if you want to uh, if you want to receive one and look forward to yeah kind of working on other projects that are i'd like to make, make more books actually there's, uh, there's about two more like the one i've made i've got in mind funding for them yeah please share the links as well and we can add them into the um like the video information and share them on the group as well that'd be great thank you yeah thank you oh, i'll yeah. stop so stop sharing how do i stop sharing it's already stopped we're oh, good yeah so uh, we'll just have a couple of minutes break if people need a quick um comfort break before we go into ralph's um discussion um yeah. Great, thank you. So, um, yeah, thank you, Ralph, for being here as well. Um, would you like to um, go ahead and begin begin your presentation discussion? Presentation discussion. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Let's let's try that. Well, hello, everyone. Um, uh, I don't really have like a PowerPoint um, slide presentation. Uh, I was envisaged, uh, envisaged that more as, a, as like a discussion between a predominantly Ellis and myself. So uh, I have all the things up and uh, if you uh, just kind of like uh, take over the lead a little bit then I can sort of like dive in. Otherwise it's just a little bit like, you know, I can kind of like swim in the ocean a little bit. If that's all right. So would you like to talk a bit about um your background and your practice, like um, what you've been doing previously, what you've been up to in the COVID times would be quite interesting to talk about. Right, okay, I have a, a quite a, a, a long uh, history of, like, of, um, of my CV. I don't really wanna go too much into details of that. So maybe kind of like focus off of the here and the now. Um, I'm working as a, as a lecturer for a graphic design at the Arts University in Bournemouth. And um, uh, basically, the time of the pandemic just like uh, kept us all extremely busy because we had to put the whole curriculum online, uh, which was a, a tremendous challenge uh, with its ups and downs. So that kept, kept me extremely busy. So uh, that's basically it. But uh, in, in my spare time, uh, I, um, I gave myself this opportunity to produce a, a book which, uh, uh, which is kind of like a spin-off from my many thoughts uh, from a, a doctorate study which I began a few years ago. And it's kind of like an essence thereof of, a, of an unpublished manuscript. And that's the book which I'd like to talk about a little bit later on into depth, which is basically this one. Would you like to talk about um, that later, did you say, or would, would you want to introduce that now at all? Or? Uh, can you speak a bit louder, please? I hardly can't hear you, so be honest. Can you hear me better now? Uh, yes, thank you. What was your question? Sorry, I couldn't understand. Um, can you talk a bit more about the book, or would you prefer to talk about that later? Um, we can, we can steam right into it, um, if you want, if you want that, if, if that's, yeah, all right. I think it could be interesting, um, especially going on from uh, Siobhan's, um, you know, presentation about her book works, it might be interesting, interesting to talk about books in general, um, that would be really good, I think. If you'd like okay. to talk about yours, and then we could talk about, you know, practice of making books. Okay, all right. Yeah, I can talk about that. So perhaps the link between uh, Shibon's, uh, how shall I say, uh, time and contemplation in, the, in this pandemic, and uh, and my my kind of like motivation is kind of like at the beginning of the year I had kind of like this urge to um, to put the, put this book out, which is uh, which turned out as a a compendium. Um, for uh, self-directed learning in art design and craft making. It's, it's kind of like super, super uh, inclusive in a sense, uh, 
um, or almost a little bit. I always think sometimes a bit grand, and I also gave it a, a tremendously grand title, which is nothing else than freedom to create. And um, and I, I wanted to hold myself back a little bit, but then I thought like once I was putting the things together, my thoughts together, I wrote the manuscript uh, within like a three months time, uh, pretty much uh, on the go. So uh, I kind of like knocked it out. Um, it's just like flowing out and then I had it. And um, I knew then uh, I wanted to make something out, out thereof. So uh, besides uh, the, the, the um, blunt word document, uh, uh, didn't kind of like, a, how should I say, it didn't kind of like resonate uh, what uh, I was intending to do. So uh, I designed it uh, and uh, design is one of my practices, kind of like the, um, the, 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 the base, the root basis of my profession and, and what, I, what I teach as well, my, my practice. Uh, and also what I'm a practicing artist as well. So it's quite a kind of complex idea. And, uh, and, and yeah, so um, that's kind of like the, the bit of the background. I was uh, looking for a publisher at the time. Uh, I made one uh, attempt to uh, contact the publishing house and gone into a, a, a small discussion. And uh, the older I get, I kind of like uh, realized the less I'm interested on like uh, uh, how and, and if and people judge my work. So uh, and going to a, to a publisher is all about, you know, like uh, being judged. Does that sell? Is that good? Can you do that? Can you make this? And so on. So on. And I was just interested. It was, I was not interested in that process at all. And, uh, and then I decided to, um, uh, to self-publish it uh, because the, I had the tremendous freedom. I did it with, with Blurb. I have a lot of books out there, Blurb. And one's just about to come out in, uh, in, in a few days. So that gives me tremendous freedom. Of course, I can do whatever I want. And um, I also know the, the, the quality standard quite well. I know how to prepare my files. So they, they came out exactly how I wanted. I know the paper quality. And I almost have a, an intimate relationship with the printer, print, printing machine there, because I know exactly how I can modify um, the colors and, 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 and the files so they came out quite nicely. So, and, and that actually, really nicely paid off with the book. So that's a bit of a background. I think it's really interesting, a lot of discussions I've been in recently with both um, artists, writers, um, whether they want to self-define as like visual artists or writers or a bit of both. Um, there, there does seem to be this kind of um, need to self-publish because of the lack of publishing opportunities. Um, and how do we go about that? How do we self-finance it? I think those things are really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And also what you mentioned about value and about how, um, what we value in society, like that would be an interesting point of conversation as well. Um, does anybody um, else have any in, um, points to make about um, making books? Does anybody else here make books or self-publish? That'd be really interesting to find out. Yeah, I will come with my books here. I do it. This is one. So the idea is you put inside the artworks that I try to to say to Shiova. This is one of them. And here are all the small ones. And that's our art books, you know. And one I do with Nomesca. So that I'm selling this moment. I put here my artworks. Um And I make uh, three, there's two and all that. So making uh, hand books is, is more solid in this moment in, in the art medium. Um, an emerge artist, so I know this is the best idea to sell postcards or something you, take, you do with your hands. These are books. Okay, very, very interesting. Are you uh, making uh, copies for yourself or you're, you're printing those, Adriana? Well, 
um, at least let me make a small presentation about me, but I don't know if I can make it in this moment. It's interesting about publishing. I had I couldn't get a publisher for Quiet London, the book I was working on, so I self-published Quiet Amsterdam, which cost quite a lot of money. I published in black and white because uh, it's cheaper than colour. And it was only then when I'd sold a thousand copies cycling around Amsterdam to bookshops that I managed to get a publisher for Quiet London. So for me, it was a means to an end. But now I self-publish partly because, not well, not just because I, it's very difficult to find publishers, um, but partly because I want to be in control of the whole process and uh, um, I like choosing the designer the images, um, but it's very hard to sell them. <laughs> and are you interested in selling a lot of books, Siobhan, out of interest? No, I do editions of 100 now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what, what, is your, what is your intention of like, what's, what's, why, why do you make books? Uh, I like the fact they're very democratic, so most people can afford a book. They can afford, um, you know, £10 for a, my photo book, but they can't afford one of my drawings, which is a lot more expensive. So, uh, but I'd like to also to put the drawings in books. A friend has just made this little one on insomnia. Uh, I did some drawings about insomnia. And that's, you know, it'd be very hard to kind of hand make individual copies of these for the same price as the postcard book that was published by me, but printed by a commercial printer. Mm -hmm. So um, I see them as important to go into libraries so that anybody can read them. What about yourself, Ralph? What kind of edition um, do you make your books in? Or is it more um, like per order? Do you do that um, where, where people order and then you print to order? Um, or is it more that you make an addition? Well, those which I do, uh, I'm uh, environmentally conscious and, uh, and I've thus decided also from, a, from an economical perspective, the print on demand model works quite well for me. The books are, the printed books, this one is, I mean, I don't have any profit margins on this one, zero, because I just, it's a gesture for me like to give back to the creative community. And uh, so it's really like uh, it's just a, the production and the distribution of, of the of the material of the of the book material, which uh, which is the cost, the occurring cost. I made this particular book uh, also in uh, as ebooks, and they can uh, be downloaded for free on various platforms. Uh, in that sense, so I'm absolutely totally not interested in making any money with this at all. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like just uh, to kind of like release something uh, back, back, which I kind of like, you know, uh, sort of like I got so much from the creative community. And that's kind of like a gesture of like letting something flow out again. That was my intention. So it's, it's not about um, becoming uh, famous or anything or becoming, a, you know, like a uh, bestseller author in that sense it's kind of like it's giving people the opportunity to access the information um, if someone would like to have a hard copy I personally am I'm a fan of hard copies and then uh, they can they can order one and if they'd like to read it on their phones they can do that as well so this is kind of like my approach of like a for this particular book in, in specific, specific all the other artist books which I've published as well they are they are print on demands. I think it's really interesting about what you're both talking about, about this kind of um, democracy and it's like a um, democracy of um, information almost as well, you know, in terms of academia, um, in that research capacity, it becomes a very precious commodity almost, doesn't it? That kind of, you know, it goes through this rigorous process of being peer reviewed and then it finally gets out, but then you have to pay for the access to the information and it kind of, filters down slowly to the public whereas I think there's something really nice about self-publishing artist books or you know whatever kind of content it is but it is that open access mm -hmm. I think that's quite an important um, democratic method of disseminating information um, yeah I totally agree I totally agree with this one um, there's also a, a, a kind of a shift as I experience it in in these uh, uh, peer-reviewed journals that um, 
that a uh, lot of, of these publishing houses, I mean, there are a lot of like, you know, they're like uh, enterprises as well. They make a lot of money with those art articles. You have to buy them when you want to read them, of course, and they're like companies. So um, that, that economical aspect is, is always there. And the prestigious journals, they are, of course, you know, paid. You have to pay for them. And um, I kind of like understand it, you know, because we live in a capitalistic society and that's just how it is. So, um, and, but uh, I think a lot of uh, journals have to be released after five years in, in the public domain. So uh, uh, as my, uh, as I understand it, they can't really like lock them down forever as such. So that, that's a good thing, I think. So uh, we all have access to all the information, particularly via the internet. I mean, there's such a freedom of information nowadays anyway, so. Uh, I think we're in a very lucky time in that sense. I think we're... By the way, if you, if you want, uh, I, I put you an uh, issue. In this moment, more people prefer a PDF than a, than a physical book. And it's more cheap for you make a digital book and sell it than send it to, I don't know, London. So uh, issues a bit, it's the best uh, application to make an artist book and make your art. Uh, maybe you do it in hand, in, in physical, then you scan it, and then you publish. And I put a link I do for when I make with my hands and for it, and put it in digital, and I can sell it in this moment. So that's the... In this moment, it's the best way to show you, you your art, to sell your art, and go more away than your local or your country. It's, I know it's very hard for all people think about digital ways to um, grow up, but in this moment, all the moments are virtual, you know, most in the yourself continue using more PDF computer than these ones in person too. So I think if you put all in a website, like Redbook, like, uh, I don't know, other stores in website, maybe you sell it more, more cheap for you, um, more originality because the diversity in digital is very, very big. I think um, it's really interesting that, you know, we've moved online a lot, um, even pre-COVID, but especially, you know, since COVID, like, because of the, the social restrictions, um, mm -hmm. you know, the conversations are online, like lots of contents online, and it's also inst instantaneous almost. So you don't, you don't have to go to the bookshop, you don't have to order the book to come to your house or your, your work. Um, but I think there is something missing from that purely digital realm. Like there's something I think really nice about and tactile about a physical book, um, especially artist books where it might be handmade or something. Um, and there's also in parallel, like with, with the social conversations, these conversations are great where we can all link in from different parts of the world, but there is something missing from that, you know, face to face human interaction. So I don't, I don't, um, I kind of almost reject that we're going exclusively online in some regards. Um, I think there is obviously a place for it and it's fantastic, but I also kind of want to hold on to that like physical <laughs> old school book and conversation. I think there's something important and valuable for me personally about those things. Um, do you have any thoughts about that, Ralph, about that kind of um, the digital versus physical? I think it's a, for me, it's a question of choice. I don't want to um, judge or uh, kind of like weigh them against each other. They both have their pros and the cons. And uh, for my, for the choice of, of this particular book to have them on both platforms as digital eBooks and as, as physical prints, I even gave, I give the, uh, the person who would like to get access to it the choice of having a, a soft cover or a hard cover as well. So I'm pretty much like covering everything uh, which, is, which is possible. Uh, again, as like a, you know, it's just like offering uh, opportunities, choices, basically. Uh, 
and so, so certain things which you mentioned are, uh, and Adriana are, are, of course, you know, they're totally relevant, particularly if they're like uh, handmade one-off objects, uh, like original drawings. I think she wants an uh, insomnia booklet. That was a one-off as well, wasn't it? Or was it? Yeah. So that that's kind of like, you know, a singular piece of, of artwork, of course, that, you know, with, with a lovely illustration in it. And they all have kind of like other, uh, other these, these medias all have like, you know, their preferences, people prefer these and, and that. And I think for me, for me, it's just nice to give uh, opportunities to, uh, to people, to how they access and how they, you know, uh, deal with, with, with the media as such. Yeah. I think it's really interesting to think about how different formats are relevant for different content. And how, uh, you know, for let's say the insomnia book that a friend made for me for my drawings, it's perfect for taking to bed. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Or> heavy. Yeah. <laughs> and the postcard book, I was going to make it as a conventional book. And then I suddenly thought, well, actually, the postcard, um, I wanted to mimic the kind of uh, the actual postcards that people send. And then I realized they could be postcards. Um, in a book where you take them out and send them to people. So I think the format is really important. So I'm interested that Ralph is doing different formats for depending on what kind of uh, uh, kind of book people want to read, you know, hardback, softback, soft cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two kind of approaches. Um, I, I see where you're coming from, Shibong. It's kind of like, uh, you kind of like, as, as the artist or author slash author in that context, you can decide, of course. Uh, I made a lot of decisions as well. It's about the format, because I, I, I thought this is such a nice you know, hand, like a really nice kind of like compendium. I could have made it like that big as well. And, and the dimensions, of course, you know, the flexibility thereof. Uh, so certain decisions we make and, and certain, th certain things, they have to be the way, isn't it? Kind of like, particularly if it's like a one-off original artwork as, as that, as this little, little uh, um, uh, good night booklet, which you just show. It's, it's lovely You put it under the pillow and, and uh, maybe it has some kind of like vibrations going through the pillowcase as well. So they're kind of like, like lo lo lovely thoughts and um, approaches and just kind of like you know, kind of like it's almost like a probe isn't it you kind of like give it out and you see what happens then afterwards so fascinating i think with each artwork though isn't it uh, you give it out once it's finished you kind of like you give it out you release it and then um, and then the audience can do whatever they want they can love it they can hate it and everything in between they can ignore it they can treasure it and they can, you know, put it aside, they can revisit it and, and all these things there, and they can own it basically. And, and that's, I think for me, that's something which is very precious and, uh, and, and nice, you know, going beyond the, of, a, um, of an object which you use, for instance, uh, if, if I buy a phone, I use the phone and so on, but, uh, but an artwork has other, uh, momentums of engagement, I guess, and 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 I find those always interesting, fascinating. Yeah, there's a conflict between the use value and the kind of um, uh, I suppose non deliberately non useful value of art, and that's why I think things like the postcards are both. In a sense, they're, they're an image that you can appreciate as an image, but there's something you can send as well. Mm -hmm. And books are like that as well, I think. Yeah, it's changing. Perhaps the kind of discrete artwork on its own is evolving into something which has a function that often to do with looking after other people or ourselves. Yeah, again, that that's uh, that's in your control, isn't it? I mean, uh, if if you kind of like, you know, if you bring in that that usefulness, that that moment, which is you know, come going back, pretty much hundred years back to the Bauhaus, of the form and the function, the usability. Yeah. Of art and 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 that that's one approach and and and, and I personally think it's just the plurality. We can do so many things and we can position ourselves. Right? My book is a, is really like a compendium. I, I meant this to you know for people to get to get a, 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 an interest in their art making, their design making, their creative process. So it is a compendium. Other books which I do are artist books, so they are more like a 
books to contemplate on, you know, look at them and, and sort of like put them away and, and see you get engaged in another way, in, a, in, in another kind of form. Or, or your, your insomnia book is, is almost like a, a therapeutic uh, moment in it, isn't it? So uh, I think the word contemplation is a really good one to use, actually. Mm -hmm. It's um, very pertinent for what artists are doing at the moment in the, you know, the, the era we're in, the years, these years of COVID. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's perhaps time to self-reflect as well, though, a little bit, isn't it? I mean, that's one, one of the moments which I used to make the book. And, um, and uh, for me, it was important to not talk about myself, but about other people. So that was, so that, that was kind of like a very important uh, decision I made there. And, and I think a lot of uh, artists kind of like took the chance or the opportunity to go go inside, isn't it? Kind of like see see what's there because it, everything slowed down, it became quiet and, uh, and all was meditative in, in, a, in a state. And, and then, then you can do many things with that state. You, know, you, can, you can stay with yourself, you can listen to yourself and then you can make something. Or you can say, well, all right, I'm here, I'm present. But I also am super aware that lots of other people out there are also, you know, like quiet out there. And uh, my intention was then to use that time to actually give tools almost like out for these people in their solitude, perhaps. I think um, another point that you've both picked up on, and Adriana as well, about um, like sending postcards and sending books, um, whether it is a whether, you, whether you're kind of like releasing this information out into the ether and then you don't necessarily know what's coming back. It, it's not always a discussion point. It's not a backwards and forwards mechanism. So almost similar to putting a, an artwork in a gallery. Mm -hmm. You don't really have control about how the viewer responds to it and you don't have the dialogue with the viewer necessarily. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that, whether, um, so for example, mail art projects might be a back and forward type of project so you do get a bit of discussion but this idea of just like letting loose this project this book into the world and not really knowing how do you feel about the kind of not knowing how it's been received in many instances if anybody wants to respond who makes books well I think uh, for me it's it, it, the not knowing and the not control is actually quite nice and uh, because again, you know, it, it's it's an act of of, dem of democracy. Uh, it's sounds giving something out, and uh, and letting people decide for themselves how they act, react, or ignore whatever in between. And you know, like it, don't like it, maybe like something, other things they don't. I quite like this uh, aspect um, because um, it's. Uh, you know, they're, they're not controlling thereof. You know, there are so many things we are, we are like, you know, kind of like some of us, you know, like, like to control, control things. And, um, and uh, I, I think this is kind of like, it, it's a very oppressive uh, moment as well. You know, if you want to control all the time, uh, other people, because you take away the freedom. And if, if you make, if you make a book, if I made a book called uh, Freedom to Create and I want to control somebody with that, that's kind of like, a, as, as such, you know, a, a huge irony in such. So uh, maybe this is kind of like an interesting moment there as well, I think. I find it quite hard when I've made a book and it's gone out into the world and I don't know what's happened to it. Um, I'd much rather have a dialogue and that's why I'm glad I'm speaking tonight so I can reflect on why I chose this format as a postcard book. But I must say that one uh, response I had from Quiet London is I went to a library to write the second book about Quiet Places in Monday, London and in the London Print Library, I met the librarian who didn't actually know I was coming because I spoke to his colleague. And he said to me, oh, I have bought your book and I keep it by my bedside to help me 
sleep at night because it's so peaceful and calm. And I just thought that was so wonderful to get that feedback. And um, uh, I didn't realise it had that effect on people. I mean, I felt like it was like that making the book. I, I really loved the places I was photographing. Um, but for me, unlike Ralph, I think to uh, have conversations with people about what I've made is really, really important. It's kind of crucial, especially during COVID times. So that's why I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to reflect on it and talk about it and hear people's responses. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps uh, the, might have gone a little bit into the into a, a polarized uh, way. I, I'm not that black and white, Siobhan. It's, it's not. It's not that I'm not interested. I'm. I'm. I'm interested in feedback. But I don't, I'm not interested in like uh, people patting my shoulders. Um, if, if, some, if some people would like to give me feedback, I'm more open to listen to it and get, in, get engaged in the conversation. I don't depend on it. And I don't, I'm not fishing for compliments. And I don't want that because in that particular book is not meant to sort of like, look what I have done. Isn't that fantastic? If people think that is fantastic, then I'm happy. If people think that's not so great, that's all right with me as well. So I, I don't depend on that feedback to sort of like, uh, you know, so kind of like my, my artistic identity sort of like, it doesn't get affected by that by doing it. I do my work anyway, you know what I mean? If that makes any sense. But you know, saying that, of course, it's always nice if people, you know, uh, think that's that's some, you've done something great. I mean, that goes without saying. I think we all need that in a way. I guess it's a multifaceted thing, isn't it? In a way, um, how, how do you how do you feel if people don't like what you do? How do you, how do you cope with that? Out of interest. Are you asking me? Yeah. Uh, I, well, for quite Amsterdam, one woman came up to, up to me and said that one bar I'd included, which didn't play background music, she said, oh, it's never quiet. Um, she said, it, uh, and she was quite critical of the fact I'd included it. Um, so we had a discussion about that, and it made me think about, yeah, my criteria and how difficult it was to find quiet places. Um, so, but I'd rather have that conversation than not have it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, because I often think like, you know, critical comments uh, are just as valuable as like uh, affirmative comments, aren't they? Uh, may maybe it's just, just kind of like, you know, that's why we are kind of like, you know, hanging out there tonight as well, having like this, a chat, I think. Just the notion of communication about uh, a, a common topic, I think, is, is valuable as such, because, you know, that's kind of like what we are, social creatures, aren't we? Absolutely, I agree. And I think it's about um, the connection and, you know, it helps our own understanding as artists just to have a dialogue about whether it's directly about the artwork. I'm just speaking from my, you know, personal opinion, whether it's talking directly about the artwork that either I've made or someone else has made or, you know, the, the ideas and issues around it, you know, you kind of almost like putting an idea out there and seeing how it bounces back <laughs> in, in a kind of like, that's how I sort of visualise it. Um, so it's not necessarily like for me looking for solutions or answers. It's more sort of how do they how do they grow and develop um, rather than a sort of black and white dichotomy type of situation. I guess I don't know if that makes any sense. But, um. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I like this idea of like growth, growth, isn't it? You put something out and it, it's got its own life as such. And uh, I, th I think that's in that is interesting with each, you know, artwork which you kind of like release as such. And, you know, to actually enable the growth, it's growing its own structure. And I think the, the less control you put onto it, the more it has the, the opportunity to grow its own, its own shape as such. And also worst case scenario, you know, it can die as well. You know, that's, that's also possible. But uh, why not, you know, why not? You do something and it's not growing or it's not growing today, maybe it grows in a year's time or something like this. I think this is our all interesting moments. Such. 
I think there's something quite interesting about the death of something as well, because like if, if something stops, then there's room for something else to grow. And there's also the idea of from destruction, you can, you can create something. So um, I suppose it, you're talking about, an, like I'm talking about an abstract idea here rather than specific, but I think that sometimes a death can be something that's creatively useful. So mm. maybe it's a death of an idea, but mm. it might be a starting point for a new idea, if that mm. makes any sense. I feel like we're yeah. going quite abstract now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I like this. It's, it's a very philosophical approach as well. And maybe there's kind of a latency as well, you know, in some works. Um, uh, and maybe an, an, an elusiveness thereof, you know, something which you don't really know if there is something there or not. Or maybe something appears later, maybe, you know, later in another phase. Maybe, you know, so, some artists. Uh, think about uh, George Orwell and Aldous Huxley, they've been so way ahead of their times. And uh, when, when the book came out, probably everybody thought, like, these guys are like, you know, lunatics. And nowadays we think that they're prophets, you know what I mean? Kind of like in terms of the, the meaning shifts as well uh, from, from an artwork, a piece of literature, art paintings, all the artworks, you know, situated in the, in the time, in the context. That's also part of the life, I think. It's very fascinating. Shall I show a few pages of the book or shall we have a little long of this conversation? How, how do you feel about that? Yeah, it'd be great to see some pages. Yeah? So everybody all right with that? I'll share some more screen then. Uh, okay. Okay. Hang on, this is the wrong side. Now, talking about this, I'm gonna take that back. Right. Can you see, what, what can you see? Can you just give me a short feedback, please, uh, Alice? So it's the front cover, I think. Um, it's the front cover, all right, right. Yeah. Okay, I just kind of like uh, walk uh, walk you guys a little bit through this and um, and uh, kind of like get this bars out of the way. Right. Okay, should work. Right. Okay. So um, coming into this book, uh, Alexander's my son, who lives in Melbourne. And uh, I was playing there uh, with, with the readability there as well. So that kind of like uh, my, uh, uh, my uh, background as a designer in, typo in typography as well comes to foreground. So this is, they are not like mistakes which are uh, built in. They're actually quite, uh, quite uh, intricate studies to actually get it as, as, as it is. And, and talking about uh, um, e-books as such, you know, if, you can zoom this in and then, uh, and then you can read it better as well. So that's obviously the benefit of, uh, um, of, an, of an ebook. And, uh, and, and then you also you see like these this, uh, really intricate details of like what, what really happens. So uh, the, the distance, the distance uh, and the proximity of the reader and the medium uh, play, plays a, a quite, quite a big role thereof. And uh, I was exploring all these moments there and I'm quite happy with this. So that's what I, what I kind of like talked about, you know, like the, the printing quality uh, and, and, and so on. So uh, I have structured the book then after I, uh, after I made the manuscript into uh, four uh, sections. So uh, what do I want to produce? How do I want to work? Which mindset brings me further? And who is my audience? Uh, I broke those uh, uh, chapters, if you want to, down into like a, a quite very sort of like basic uh, um, um, uh, thinking frameworks. So uh, I talked about, you know, aesthetics, topics, disciplines as such going on of like, you know, what, what I want to produce. And kind of like um, these pages then inside the book um, are, uh, 
uh, quite straightforward, I think. So uh, how it is structured is I always started with a, with a sentence up, uh, sorry, uh, an affirmative statement up there. Um, that was very important um, uh, because um, the whole language in the book, which I used, I uh, really rigorously avoided any single negative term in the book. So there's not such a thing as like a, a, a don't or do not. It's always affirmative and positive. And uh, I, uh, for me, that, that was important because um, the, the energy of like creating something is, is for me a per, per se, you know, from a philosophical point of view, something something positive you don't you don't do something negative when you want to grow or when to, or when you want to create unless you want to destroy but that's a kind of like a creation as well and as such so it's always like philosophical moments flow flowing flow into this so they all they always like these statements up there and then i, I address the reader uh, with a with a very direct questions uh, always coming up ask yourself uh, so here, how much uh, do I bring uh, myself? So I have to uh, bring this stupid bar up here. So how much do I bring myself into my work and how much do I take myself out of it? So for me, these, these questions, I mean, I can contemplate about this like for a very long time and I can revisit these questions so often and I always like find out other answers for myself. And the other one, how decisive is a, a trademark approach to me, like a style philosophy medium that my audience can recognize. And that applies for, you know, for all the disciplines. There can be like an, an art discipline, there can be a design discipline, can be a craft making discipline as well. For instance, if you think about the carpenter uh, who makes a, a certain cabinet uh, in a, with a particular wood, you know, does he want this kind of like, uh, identity uh, related to his work or not. And, uh, you know, this kind of like trademark approach. Uh, and how important is it for me uh, to express my opinion, biography, background, et cetera, in my work? Um, again, you know, um, the, the, for me, the, these questions are so super central and just about contemplating about this very first page um, will keep me, uh, it, it does actually still keep me extremely busy and, uh, and, and kind of like, you know, helps me to also to shape my artist identity and my designer ad identity at the same time, because the answers I give to myself are changing and, and I anticipate that works with the, with the reader uh, as well. So uh, uh, here are the, the uh, moment of aesthetics. I don't go through all of them, just a couple of more so you guys can understand the principle. Explore forms that fascinate you as you progress through your work. And the fascination, again, you know, that's something uh, which, again, looking at myself and talking to a lot of, of other people who make work, that's, that's why we do things, because it fascinates us. So it's that intrinsic motivation which drives us uh, or to, to, to produce something. So, so then down there um, with the questions then, uh, which aesthetics, genres, philosophy uh, of art and design am I attracted to? Again, you know, to answer this question for myself is like a, a, flu, a fluid process. It's a huge minefield to actually dive into about uh, the philosophy of aesthetics. And it's such a rich wealth of like knowledge and ideas and thoughts by, by such great thinkers to help me find my own way in, in this you know, sea of, uh, of, uh, uh, of creation, if you want to, if you want so. Um, the next question, uh, what, what are the practitioners that I'm working with uh, uh, in my, who are the practitioners uh, that are working within my chosen domain? So including everyone who makes art design and or crafts. So the relation, the context, again, you know, uh, as a creator in, in, the, in, the, in the creative discipline, we are never alone and, uh, you know, just just by the fact of like you know like Shibon and 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 myself talking about you know we're both making artist books. There's something which you have in common, 
and uh, and that exchange that you know that brief little discussion we had i mean i thought that was quite a uh, quite a, uh, constructive you know it kind of brings you into like a, a different uh, momentum you think about things which you didn't think before so again that question of kind of like you know getting engaged in the discussion uh, works works quite well here and um, and then the next question on that aesthetics question is like, what could I add, adapt, develop uh, to express my voice? Uh, what has already been done? Again, we never work in a void. And, uh, and the, this thought as such, this question of purposely like thinking, what, what can I bring to the dinner plate? What is, what is really like, you know, what is interesting, not just in terms of like uh, self-expression, uh, so if you go back to the you to the you uh, side to the first uh, first paragraph, if you want, so this kind of like the interlinkage of these questions, I find those extremely fascinating, and they give you other answers always, and they kind of like weave weaving uh, of of the thoughts uh, ma makes the book for for me uh, uh, really uh, uh, really exciting, and rich as well. So, uh, and, and and here again, work on topics that are relevant for you. Um, again, you know, making the link to the previous presidents to Shibons, uh, the search for the for the quiet spaces was relevant to her, uh, to her bio biography and so on and so on, and then sharing that experience with the wider community. That's kind of like a, a clear anchor which you can give yourself as, as an artist or creative practitioner to choose a topic as such, which uh, I think we have really nicely seen before. And, th and then you can ask yourself, are my interests situated in the past, present or future? You know, if you are looking to a history, again, you know, looking at Chibon's presentation, uh, what have, uh, how have people photographed, used uh, postcards in the past that was relevant? But perhaps there's something in the present, which is the pandemic. And then you can also contemplate, well, how does, how is, you know, the, the quiet place in the future, how could that look like as a visionary approach as such? So, you know, this kind of like situation of the topics, situating the topics in, in the timeline are always interesting questions to ask, I think. And then you can say, uh, are any specific themes that I wish to consider in my uh, practice? Again, I'm uh, making this link to the, to, uh, to any, any, also Adriana's, uh, um, uh, a lovely little booklets, uh, these abstract shapes, you know, that's kind of like things which, which you kind of like hooked onto it and which, which, which we like to elaborate and further expand. Uh, maybe it's the medium uh, as well, not just the topic. Uh, and, and then the question again, you know, how much of myself do I want to bring into the work? Or what, what kind of relevance does that have? And then an, another question, which is related to the topic, is do I have uh, educational, political, aesthetic, practical, decorative, etc. intentions? Again, you know, is, do I have an intention? We talked about the functionality, about contemplation, about art. Uh, if, if we take a, uh, the discipline of architecture that has a very practical uh, approach sometimes, Sometimes it has uh, uh, more of an aesthetic approach if you think about a monument uh, as such. So uh, again, you know, I, I try to keep these, uh, these questions as open as possible so that uh, people from dis different disciplines have really like something for themselves to, uh, to work with and find their own kind of like grip in their practice. Uh, I'll I give you one more page uh, here that's maybe quite nicely in that context as well about the discipline. So uh, um, I myself uh, call myself as a, a post-disciplinary uh, artist, uh, practitioner, creative practitioner. I don't even want myself to put myself just in the, in the pigeonhole of being an artist. So choose, combine, switch, and merge art, design, and craft as you develop your process. I think this, for me, this is something which I thoroughly enjoy of, uh, again, you know, it is like a, a, the, the freedom which I have as, as, a create, as a creator. I can do these things and I make use of that. I just did some uh, ink, ink drawings. I've never done a single ink drawing 
in my uh, past decades of my life and I, I found them extremely interesting. So uh, that, that, uh, that notion again as an encouragement uh, but but not not saying you know like uh, that that everybody should do that now. There, therefore, the questions you know what is the relation between the topic that I work and the discipline that I practice? Uh, for instance, you know, do I have a political intention? Maybe I then make more like a, a work more in a campaign in a campaigning field in a, in a visual communication aspect. So that has a very practical approach. Or maybe it is about contemplation, and then the the topic being being really blunt about is uh, a beautiful flower painting has just its relevance uh, of existence than a than a you know a, a self uh, a social critical piece of piece of work or from a practical context uh, in a design context the shape of a drinking glass. Has, has just also a relevance of the practice when you choose the discipline. And that, that goes then back to uh, uh, the materials, techniques, tools am I attracted to? That can also be a really interesting question. You know, we talked about making artist books, the, the joy of, of doing them. That, that is a, a material and a technique and a tool, which I, I'm personally at the moment, I'm, I'm super interested in, in, in doing it. And, and then the question of like the discipline comes from the materiality uh, of, of my interests as a second go. So I just switch to the to the next page. Just want to finish that last sentence. And then, then the question: Do I categorize myself as an artist, designer, craft maker, or someone floating across disciplinary boundaries? Again, you know, there's not such a thing as a right and a wrong. But I hope that by these uh, questions. Uh, maybe uh, the reader uh, starts thinking about this. You know, maybe uh, the reader always thought like he's a designer, but uh, maybe through another question asking like, you know, how much, how much is it important to bring myself into a work? Maybe then, uh, then he thinks maybe I'm more of an artist than a designer, which um, I had a few students who made these, these uh, uh, shifts. And I myself made, made this big shift between, uh, be, between art and design. So, um, yeah, so this kind of like are, are the thoughts of just like, you know, these three pages I, uh, I showed, stop sharing now. And uh, show, showing you guys uh, my, my thoughts and, and hopefully, you know, the kind of like the to the compendium idea of, of the book, which is behind, came, came across as such. That, that's kind of like my wish. Thank you. It's a, it's a really kind of interesting framework to to see it as a framework as well. Like I can definitely um, see the educational uh, qualities coming through. Um, and it's interesting to look at it from a sort of self perspective, but also as a sort of, I wanted to use the word tool, but I don't think I'm quite mean tool. Maybe framework is a better word, like a framework for other people to use. So it's kind of, it's accessible for lots of people um, but there's like a like a common ground. Just some thoughts. Does anybody else have any questions or thoughts? Yeah, I, I have a question, Ralph. Um, hi, good to see you. Um, I'm, I I should say I'm I'm a friend and colleague of Ralph, so I, <laughs> I you know I I know the the work a little bit. But it was really interesting to hear you talk about it. Um, because you kind of open up things for me that I hadn't kind of seen in it, you know, before. Uh, but I have two questions. One, um, a simple one about the use of this book. Have you have you used it yourself already in term, in with your students, or are you are you intending to make use of it in some some way within your teaching? Um, uh, yes. Because to me, uh, I'm asking the question because it, it strikes me as something which could really prompt be used. You know, I could even use it on my, you know, uh, as a prompt. These questions are very, you know, they they um, they're very useful as prompts for um, for a discussion among students. I think. Exactly. So, uh, so th thanks for the for the for the input, Peter. 
Uh, yes, the, the answer is simply yes. I mean, I I wrote them down in almost like a stream of consciousness, but you know, by just like me like explaining this uh, in, in this forum, I, I actually realized again the depth thereof. You know, it almost makes me shiver of of you know how how you know how how deep these questions really are and how substantial as well. And of course, you know that. The book is now at, at AB, AUB's library, all, all formats thereof, and, and we make the book launch uh, uh, after in the beginning of the new semester, so celebrate a book launch. And uh, I am I'm totally interested to work with students with this. I, a friend of mine uh, is going through the book in almost a, a mindful with, with a mindfulness, and she reads the book like three or four pages a day. Uh, and then she needs to put it aside because if you get really, if you start really engaging with these questions, then they become really substantial. So, uh, so I, I think that's what what's in it in the book again. But again, this is an invitation, you know, and that, that goes back uh, to the previous discussion we had before. Of, like you know, you give something out and then you see what happens, how you, you resonate, how you react with the book, and that's kind of like then in the open open sphere i think yeah i mean what what i really appreciate is and i wondered about the questions themselves if they took you a long time to to formulate or to articulate because what i find um not only in my own work but also with students working with students research students especially is that they find it very difficult to formulate a simple question uh, and that has that kind of depth if you like, you know, especially if you think about research questions, mm -hmm. you know, they, um, there's a tendency to overcomplicate, you know, questions, putting in difficult words or, you know, and what strikes me here is that you, you make an effort to put a quiz question quite simply mm -hmm. and, and yet, you know, include that, that sense of depth once you let it sink in and spend a day with it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and be kind of generous in that way. Uh, and, and that I think is kind of lacking a little bit in our educational system, you know, having that generosity of saying, okay, let's spend, you know, a session uh, looking at some questions and, and how we can formulate them in a way that everyone can understand them. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it turns out to be something very difficult. And I wondered how, how much time you spent on uh, sort of formulating these questions, whether you had to edit, the, edit them or, uh, you know, whether they came sort of like naturally. Um, mm -hmm. Well, um, through, through my research with the, at, at Alto, this autoethnography, where I uh, wanted to find out we self-reflect, you know, starting with a, uh, with a, with a, with a really uh, basic, you know, fundamental. Let me just share my screen again. Uh, it's, it's uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, I just try to get a, a page up um, for this on um, tick. Well, that should work now. Um, right? Can you see that? Yeah, we see mosaic. Um, that's um, the um, uh, the inscription of uh, of the of the temple of uh, 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 Apollo at, at Delphi, where Socrates walked through, uh, asking the the oracle of like uh, who is the smartest person uh, in the, in the world. And 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 uh, uh, it goes like yeah, you know she said that it's it's you Socrates, and he said well I don't know, I don't know anything you know <laughs> and it's you know we all know the story it's brilliant and uh, and uh, and and it says you know know like know thyself and um, and and this is you know such a such a strong momentum again you know from a philosophical point of view of like getting a grip on life. Uh, which, which I looked at myself first in the four walls, so through an auto ethnography research, like a question of like asking myself, like, why do I make art? How do I make art? What, what's the reason, you know, what's the purpose of like me doing art? 
uh, in, in the first moment of looking at my process and in the second moment of my research, I looked at my outcomes, like what do my artworks mean to myself and to other people? So asking all these questions from a sort of pratic point of view to myself, they were all in myself. And I had a lot of like discussions about like, you know, autoethnography, yeah, is that research and all these things we talked about that. And that's still a discrepancy, a problem in academia. But I always knew, you know, if I can give myself these answers, if I contemplate, other people can do that as well. And these questions now which are in this book they kind of like they just flew out because i asked those uh, questions to myself so many times that i just can let them out and say well if i can ask myself you can ask that to yourself as well it gave me value let's see what it does to you so the answer was actually quite you know it's almost like a stream of consciousness coming out almost like you know here it is also kind of like an evidence you know like autoethnography is not just about yourself it's not you know here's the evidence in, in a sense in an academic context mm. if that makes any sense yeah no thanks i i yeah i think that i mean i don't want to sort of hijack the discussions of what could go on forever <laughs> i just think it brings up a lot of other questions you know around how how we how we teach, you know, how we get students to talk, you know, in a in a in a Zoom uh, seminar or wherever in the classroom, and and that there's there's often a sense of intimidation, you know, that they don't feel um, empowered enough, you know, or or confident enough to ask questions, mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's you know I I. I, in that context, talk a lot about the silly question. Well, let's just get a silly question out first, you know, and that sort of breaks the ice. I, agree. I think you're doing yeah. something, you're doing something here with this book that mm -hmm. helps to break the ice in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and this ice can be very thick, you know, yeah. in some, yeah. some context. Yeah, yeah, totally. So in that sense, it's very disruptive. And I've, I, I was uh, wondering whether the graphics of your book were e meant to be equally kind of disruptive, um, whether you had anything to say about the aesthetics of the, of the book. Um, well, it, as, the more I sort of like think about the outcome and talk about people, and that goes back again to the discussion we had before with, uh, with Shibon about like, you know, the reaction to, do we want like always have a positive reaction? I'm open to all kinds of all sorts of reactions. And I think that's kind of like an interesting moment there as well. So, so many people saw this in a different shape, like, you know, uh, Susie's, Susie just, you know, in, in, in a very, genuine way said that's an artwork as such and uh, you can say well yeah why not you know uh, it, and it is a compendium it says something very practical and, and and that contextualization thereof is 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 for me super important that actually people can do that with with it as well uh, for me I, I wanted to give it a uh, an aesthetic the aesthetic, the, the design approach thereof is like, uh, I, was, I was under a, a tremendous creative anxiety when I produced the book, uh, which I've never experienced with any art that I've, I've ever done because of its practical use thereof. You know, I kind of like wanted to have this, uh, this tension in there of it being an aesthetic experience, a visually aesthetic experience, not just a text or a set of questions to read as, as like on a blog, but also a visual engagement with, with jolting the readability purposely because mm. um, it is not, not always the case, you know, that first of all, that these questions are just black on white. And they're, not, they're not, you know, sometimes you really have to dig for these questions. And so are the answers. They are quite, it's quite a lively thing, I think, quite a, 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 a you know, a, a creation thereof, you know, if, if you think about like, you know, uh, an I creative identity uh, thereof. And I wanted to give this book a visual identity thereof, a, as it's such, not my identity, but its own identity as such. So I didn't want to be this like a generic modernist book, 
with no with no aesthetic, just pure information. I wanted to give this because that's what it's all about. Hmm. That makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Anyone else like to say something? Oh, uh, Willem and I can continue like this for no end. We can go on forever. Sorry, we become some kind of, you know, piece of entertainment when we get on to. Yeah, Alice, there's one thing you were saying earlier about the digital uh, digital versus analog or, but I think uh, I've seen um, in, certainly in audio music is that first you had like uh, the samplers and there's like a uh, kind of cheap and quick, easy way to do something that was quite hard and expensive to do. And then uh, things got better, but now people are like creating software to recreate the sound of the old things because mm -hmm. it's got its own it's become its own aesthetic now mm -hmm. so maybe we have the same thing with uh, books and and uh, visuals like people will be collecting old kindles and tablets because they have a look or they they do something that's that's an interesting thought uh, that that parallel of of, of music and, and in terms of like uh, mixing the media, I, I make a lot of video artworks and make soundtracks thereof as well. So I work with both digital mm -hmm. and, and analog sounds without having a formal education in music, but I still thoroughly enjoy it. Um, for, for me, the music is interesting because uh, the, to, to make samples, uh, to, to, sa to sample music analog sound and analog samples and digitally modify them. And then at the end, you know, when it comes out of a speaker, it is an uh, analog signal as well. It's just sound waves coming out. It's not a yeah. digital. So uh, it's super interesting. The sound is totally interesting in, in that sense. And, and, and also the, the imitation thereof, you know, and if you start like uh, looping sounds as well, that's super interesting. Mm. Yeah, because if you think of a, a, a speaker as like a screen, then uh, it's amazing if you think about it, there's so many things that you have only heard on a speaker. So it's like a, a, you've only ever seen it on a screen or... Yeah, that, that's yeah. A, and it's okay, you, yeah. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit? I think you are on to something. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I am, but uh, yeah, I think uh, we, ooh. yeah, like if you go to a concert, you're not hearing, you're hearing, you're hearing everything through the speaker. So you're not hearing the drum kit, you're not hearing the, well, they also the electric instruments, you don't hear that, you never hear them anyway, you always hear them through speakers. So we've all kind of like, got ourselves away from the base base reality. We're always in another level. That's quite interesting. But then again, if you think about like, for instance, a rock concert where you have like amplified guitars. Yeah. So uh, if, you pluck the, if you pluck the guitar from the amp, then you have like this really sort of dull sound coming off. And, uh, and, and, then, and then you bring it in. It's, it's kind of an interesting, mm. just the amplification of the sound. If you put a, a microphone into a cello and you want to reproduce the original cello sounds, which is the volume just becomes more, uh, more powerful. Yeah. But who, who knows what a real cello sounds like nowadays? That's very interesting, yes. That's very, a very interesting question. Not so many people. Like sitting in, in a live concert without any electronics, well, that's kind of like the unplugged experience, isn't it? Yeah, and it's quite rare now. Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. Yeah. Do you do you particularly treasure those or? Have you... No, not really. <laughs> okay. No, no. Uh, uh, no, it's uh, well, it's weird actually because when I listen to uh, uh, vinyl records, somehow they they do that. So you get this, uh, you get this moment when you're pierced because it sounds like something's in the room really there. That's quite interesting. Yeah. There's like this, uh, the, this notion of the uh, the aura of an artwork. Um, 
mm. uh, which has been described uh, as something which is kind of like almost tangible around a piece of piece of art, particularly in the, in the painting, which you, which you can't uh, which you can't reproduce as such. Uh, so maybe. Yeah, but, I'm quite, but I'm quite happy with the facsimile of the like playing a record on my hi-fi and then getting this moment where I get goosebumps because it really sounds like the sax or something is really in the room. Yeah, yeah, quite interesting. I'm, yeah, I'm quite happy I, with the facsimile. <laughs> I don't need the real sax. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. But so that's like a really close reproduction. How, how do you feel like when you stand in front of a real sax? I don't know if it's a really close, I don't think it is actually, but there's something about it that has an element of the, the real thing. Interesting. So that's kind of like something in between, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, because actually, if I remember back to real saxophone, like really hearing a saxophone in front of you, it's it's quite a physical experience. It's quite different. It is, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's not. It's not just the instrument, isn't it? It's kind no, of like the whole. Like, yeah. You're like in in this moment. Yeah, you feel it. Yeah. And that's why I think when we write on a postcard and send it to somebody, it kind of acquires a different aura to an unmarked uh, postcard. Mm. That's interesting as well, isn't it? I was just thinking, I, I gave this advice to a, a someone I know, uh, not not well, but I, I know I know a little bit. And she, she has like that, that uh, idea of like being bored, something which I, I don't know. She seems kind of like sits around elderly legs. She's always bored with herself, kind of like almost tragic. I have the opposite experience and I never have enough time. Mm. So I said to, to one, uh, why don't you just write a handwritten letter to a friend which you haven't seen for the past 10 years and send it with a with a post stamp you know you go to the post office and you and you ask the the post office uh, uh lady to you know show her the stamps you know who has done that you know all the birds you know not not just queenie on it mm. but but you know the really greatly designed stamps and then stick it on, you know, lick it, lick the stamp and put it on onto like the envelope or postcard and then send it off. If, you know, maybe the letter or the postcard goes into like the rain, it gets a bit damaged. All this experience of the journey as well, that's kind of like part, uh, very uh, kind of like an authenticity, isn't it? Like sending a message uh, for, for, from somebody to somebody. Uh, in a real analog way, isn't it? So that's kind of like a really nice link with Errol just mentioned. Mm. Interesting. That's a, that's a really interesting kind of full circle um, of the, the conversation. Um, I'm going to wrap it up now, which is a shame because there's so much, it feels like there's so much more to talk about, I feel, but um, I do have to go, unfortunately. Um, thank you so much, um, everybody, particularly uh, Siobhan and, and Ralph for those you know, very interesting, um, fascinating artworks and prompts as well. Really great discussions. Um, so hopefully you can come back and make another session. Um, it'd be really great to see you all again. Um, but if not, like, it's been fantastic meeting you all um, and seeing some of you again. So thank you so much. Thank um, you, Alice, for helping to organise it. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah, second that. Uh... Shibon to Alice, thank you so much for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to, for this, you know, uh, platform and, and maybe some, some ideas kind of like, uh, you know, hopefully sparked somewhere. And that's kind of like a, a nice wish, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for the meeting. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.